This is episode 61. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the Business of Architecture show where we talk about running a fun, profitable, and enjoyable business as architects. Now, today's show is sponsored by the Business of Architecture Conference, which is going to have everything you ever wanted to know about starting an architecture firm, about running a successful and fun firm, architect as developer, bringing on lots of great and wonderful speakers to that. That'll be coming. Look for information about that in early October. Today, we're joined by Ray Kogan, of president of Kogan & Company. He specializes in strategic planning for architecture engineering firms. And Ray also co-authored the book Strategic Planning for Design Firms. And today, we're going to talk about, as we've talked about in the past with some other guests, we're going to talk about strategic planning for architecture firms and why this is so important. So first of all, Ray, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Ray, it's it's glad to have you on here, and this is a this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart because when I think about strategic planning for architecture firms, I think about a roadmap, and that quote from Alice in Wonderland always comes to mind where she's talking to the Cheshire cat. It's it's uh, amusing to hear you say that, Enoch, because uh, uh, first of all, the roadmap metaphor is a very common and very popular one that people use when they when they talk about strategic planning, and I think it's a very apt metaphor too, and in the latest issue of the AIA uh, and Wiley uh, Architects Handbook of Professional Practice, the one that was just published, uh, my business partner and I wrote the section on strategic planning, and we happen to have selected that exa exact same Alice in Wonderland quote to insert into that chapter of the handbook. So yes, people use it a lot. And please tell me for the record the name of your partner so we can give. Absolutely. My credit. partner is uh, Kara Bobchek. Uh, C-A-R-A, Kara -A, Bobchek, and she and I have been working together, <clears throat> pardon me, since the mid-1980s. Uh, <clears throat> Let you grab a drink there. Now, sorry about that. No problem. So, you know, in terms of strategic planning, it, it comes to mind, I remember <coughs> when, I, when I started researching uh, way back in the day when I started getting more interested in the business of architecture, I remember a quote or something by Glenn Murcutt where he said that, um, the kind of jobs we accept today will be the kind of jobs that we accept tomorrow. And it's always been difficult as a, as a solo architect or a small practitioner, especially when in a startup phase where every job counts, to try to figure out what, you know, where do we go with that? Do we accept a job just for the money or how does the strategy work into it? What's the importance of having a strategic firm and a strategic plan in terms of getting to where we want to be? What are your thoughts on that? Well, almost every strategic plan, <clears throat> I apologize, <clears throat> something in my throat suddenly, almost every strategic plan that I work on contains uh, addressing markets and marketing, specifically <clears throat> what I call target markets. And I think one of the forces working against architects is desperation. The feeling that if I don't take this job, I'm going to starve. It's especially acute for sole practitioners or small firms, <clears throat> but it's true even for larger firms. I see larger firms losing their focus, losing their way, veering off the roadmap, if you will, and taking anything they can get. And over the 20 years that I've been doing this, I've come to believe strongly in the power of focus, determining what are your best target markets, what is a good, healthy, strategic diversification, which means inherently saying no as well as saying yes. I think that's uh, vitally important for firms. Ray, have you heard of firms, and I, I've heard through the grapevine, and I don't have any specific examples, but in terms of accepting some projects and not accepting others, that there are you know, some high design firms out there that publicize these projects that they they want to publicize, but then on the back end they have they have other projects they bring in their bread and butter that um, just kind of pay the bills and oh, kind of yes. allow them to pursue the design work. Is that something it's, that firms do? That I've seen? seen that happen on occasion, uh, and in fact, I'm reminded of a firm that I worked with many years ago in the Pacific Northwest that had exactly that kind of a situation. Um, they prided themselves on high design. 
and there was a contingent in the firm that only wanted to work on that. And then there was another part of the firm, roughly half the firm, that did big box retail. They had <clears throat> one or two patron clients. It paid the bills. It was profitable. Um, we and they used to joke that basically the money they made on the big box retail, they would lose on the high design projects. So they pretty much broke even. The difficulty is running two different firms because essentially those are two different firms under one roof and the cultures are different. You can imagine that everything is different. The type of people you attract, the way you produce the work, the technologies you use, the type of sub consultants you employ, every single thing is different. And the two don't go along very well. It's it's really kind of a schizophrenic way to run a firm. A, a person couldn't do that and a firm really can't. And And in fact, an unhappy ending, this firm wound up disintegrating. They they literally imploded. Uh, they couldn't get along. They had this oil and water culture, and neither one would give give way to the other. So they wound up literally going out of business. It's a sad, sad story. What suggestion would you have for an alternate way, or what would you suggest as a, a more positive way to approach that that problem? Oh, I've got all kinds of ideas for that. Uh, well, first of all, as I mentioned before, focus is really, really important. If you think about why clients hire an architect, and assuming the vast majority of people listening or watching this are architects, clients hire an architect because in theory, the architect knows something more than the client does. And I believe this is true for every scale of project. Uh, a residential homeowner wanting to do an addition or renovation to their house or a new house thinking, well, the architect knows more about how to design a house than I do. I'm a layperson. I think it's true for very sophisticated projects, healthcare projects, hospitals, acute care hospitals. Hospitals hire healthcare architects because ostensibly those architects know more about hospital design and the latest trends and what's the best technique for this and construction and all that that goes along with it than a hospital administrator or a group of doctors. So I think inherent in that knowledge that architects should bring to their clients is a focus and a and a an accumulation and building of of specialized expertise in a project type in a client type. I once heard um, Art Gensler, the founder of Gensler, of course, say that the key is knowing more about a client's business than they do. Now I don't think he meant that literally. I don't think that architects that work on banks know more about banking than bankers do, but they know more about how that translates into banking facilities. So I think that's true for architects who work on schools, uh, commercial buildings, office buildings, retail, maybe even residential too. So so I'll, I'll just go on with that. So the idea, I think, for any architecture firm, small, large, medium, is to have what I would call strategic focus and strategic diversification. To me, that means not having all your eggs in one basket, because one thing that any of us who have been in this business know is that we're in a cyclical, even volatile business over the years. And too many eggs in one basket means that basket goes up and down over time. And, and we've all experienced that for worse or for better. But if you choose several markets, several types of clients, several types of projects that are independently cyclical, that are driven by different factors, different forces, so that in theory, they won't all be down at the same time, then you will have a better chance of having a stable, growing practice over time. Interesting. So sort of a combination of the two in terms of you know, not necessarily being a generalist, having a couple of uh, specializations, but having specializations where the the cyclical aspects sort of balance each other out. Yes, ex exactly that. Um, and and there are ways to get at what these, what I call target markets should be. Uh, well, first of all, I think if you're an architect, you need to you need to like it. You need to have sorry for the cliche a passion for it. Uh, there's no point in doing work that you don't enjoy doing. You used the word fun in your introduction here, and I believe that that's exactly what this should be. So healthcare architects better like working on hospitals and feel like they're doing good for the world and enjoying what they do. Otherwise, they shouldn't be working on those kinds of projects. Likewise, for residential architects working with homeowners, same thing. Some of us may find that frustrating. Others find it gratifying. So you need to pick several target markets, different types of clients, different types of projects that you really enjoy doing or 
that others who are in your practice enjoy doing. We're assuming that practices aren't necessarily sole practitioners and that have these different factors, economic factors, demographic factors, regulatory, all kinds of things drive markets up and down. So is it fair to say that that would be the first step in developing a strategic plan or is there something before that? Well, uh, that's not exactly a step in a strategic plan in the planning process. What I would say is that identifying your target markets and strategizing what to do about them is an important component in any strategic plan. It's not really part of the process. Ray, what should architects think about when they're identifying a target market in your experience? You have to understand it. Um, if you if you take Art Gensler's advice, even close to literally, you have to really know a lot about it. Uh, you have to be able to demonstrate that to prospective clients so that they believe and have confidence in your ability to help them in that way. Uh, so there's research to be done. There's learning to be had. Uh, putting yourself in the client's shoes is is uh, vital to that. Have you seen any successful or strategies for being able to do that research to put oneself in the client's shoes? How Do you have any suggestions for how to go about doing that? I do. Um, uh, one suggestion is difficult to describe in this kind of uh, a venue here where we're where we're uh, videoing to each other. So I may have to gesture with my hands a little bit. So sometimes when I work with clients in a in a retreat in a workshop, which is typically the culmination of the strategic planning process, I go through what I call a market focus matrix. So if you imagine a tic tac toe board, uh, a matrix with nine cells, three by three. On one axis, you estimate what the market demand will be in a given market over the next several years. Is it going to be a strong market for the next several years? Is it going to be a weak market? Or is it going to be somewhere in the middle? Uh, and of course, it takes a little bit of knowledge to be able to do this. You have to be able to forecast. You have to know something about the market. But as best you can, you estimate that. That's typically on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, you look at your own firm large, small, or in between. And as objectively as you can, you ask yourself, well, how competitive are we in that market today? Not can we do something in that market? Because we all know that we as architects are are trained from the beginning to design everything from a brochure cover to a high-rise building. How competitive are you? How easily could you win work in that market? Are you strong? The top row might be strong. The bottom row might be Admittedly, we're not strong in that market. There are other players that are better than us or more competitive than us. And the middle is the middle. And if you look at that and if you make the assumption that the biggest bang for the buck, the best return on investment for marketing resources, and every firm has a finite amount of marketing resources you can devote to going out and getting work, that the best return on that investment will be where two things intersect. A healthy market for at least the next several years, which gives you time to take advantage of it. And we have a pretty good competitive position. We already have a head start in that market. That would say, well, those should be our target markets. The opposite, a weak market for the next several years and one in which we already are not a very good, a strong player. Why would you want to invest anything in that? More to the point, why would you even say yes to an opportunity that came up? Architects always say, well, what if one is, falls into our lap? What if we just happen to get a job? I would say, well, then you want to probably say no to those because there's an opportunity cost. Doing a job where you're a weak player and it's a bad market means you're probably not going to get much more of that kind of work, right? There isn't much more to be had. You're probably going to not make much money at it because it's a relatively new project type or client type or market for you. The ingredients are not positive and it's keeping you from going after and doing the type of work that will give you a better profitability, that will be more fun for you, will lead to a better practice. So it's all about focus and saying no is just as important as saying yes. Okay. So Ray, I'd like to stop here and just go back a little bit and kind of tell me a little bit about yourself. Just help us to get to know you. You know, what what's your background and what brought you to do the business consulting that you're currently involved in? Sure. Uh, well, I am an architect. Uh, I have a degree from The Ohio State University. Uh, I grew up in in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, and practice as an architect, uh, uh, intern architect, uh, 
then later a project architect and even a young project manager. Um, and I've been registered since 1979 uh, and an AIA member all that time. And I was working for a fairly large firm. I moved to the Washington, D.C. area where I'm based now. And um, and that firm had a marketing department, a whole marketing department. And I kind of was intrigued by that and asked if I could try my hand at that. And I liked it and took to it and did OK at it. And that put me in closer touch with management of the company. I was I was even though not a partner, I was on, quote, partners row. So um um, so I did that for a while, was involved in a number of industry groups, and was invited to join a, a friend of mine at the time in her practice uh, doing what I do right now, strategic planning for architecture and engineering firms. That was 20 years ago, a uh, little more, 1993, and I've been doing that ever since. Uh, we had our practice for about four years. Uh, then I joined a, a national practice, Zweig White, where I ran their strategic planning for about five years. And then uh, started my own business uh, about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. So, Ray, when you come in to work with a company, what's the first step that you that you take? Well, I have to know what what's going on in the company. Again, whatever the size of the firm is, architecture or engineering. And there are uh, great similarities between the two, uh, at least when it comes to strategic planning. Um, I have to know what goes on in the firm, what works, what doesn't work, what their aspirations are. So I always conduct interviews. I meet the partners, the principals, whatever the people are called, key staff members, and I ask them questions, open-ended questions, really encouraging them just to take a big step back from the day-to-day -day crush of deadlines and uh, proposals and RFIs and problems in the field and irate clients and everything, and to take a broad look at their business, uh, sort of the 30,000-foot view and tell me what they envision for the future of the firm and what's going to help it get there and what's going to stand in the way of it getting there. And from a group of interviews, I can discern, I believe anyone could discern, what the themes are that bubble up to the top, the kinds of issues we need to address in a strategic plan. So um, it's important to document all that, to write it all down so it's irrefutable in black and white and everybody can see what the collective thinking of the leadership of the firm is. Again, whether that's a small group or a large group. So, so the first step is figuring out what's working in the firm, what's not working in the firm, and what the aspirations, the vision of the firm is and putting that all into, into writing so we can have a good starting point. After that, I always conduct a retreat. I mentioned the retreat a few minutes ago. Whether you call it a retreat or a workshop, it's getting the leadership of the firm together, sometimes the current leadership as well as future leadership, up and comers in the firm, and talking about the vision for the future of the firm. What does it want to be like in maybe five years or more? And then identifying what are the issues we need to address that otherwise could stand in the way and addressing those issues with strategies, with action items, so that we clear the path and allow the firm to proceed toward its vision unimpeded. And then, of course, you have to implement the plan. You have to do what you said you're going to do. This is the trickiest part because firms, I think, tend to over plan and under implement. You know, you spend a couple of days in a retreat dreaming up what the firm should be, and then you get back to the world and, uh, a lot of things intrude on the time, and you have to be realistic about this. So implementation is no mean feat, but there are ways to ensure that that happens better. And I also believe in sharing, communicating the plan with the entire staff of the firm. I think that's crucial. Uh, uh, not to be melodramatic, but a lot of people's livelihoods and careers depend on what the strategic plan for a firm is, especially in a, in a profession as difficult as architecture. And to be really direct about it, these days... With the economy warming up, all those employees have a lot more opportunity to go elsewhere. So you want to keep those people in the fold. You want to make them feel like they're part of the firm. You want to make them feel important, that their input is valued, their contributions are valued. So more than ever, sharing the plan and making everyone aware of what the future of the firm is, is, is vital. Ray, at the beginning of this process, when you're going through the investigation and the research phase of talking to people, are there a couple of questions that you find are particularly important and particularly uh, give you good um, good information? And if so, what would those questions be? Well, there are. There are. Um, in general, I always like to start out asking uh, what I said a moment ago about the vision for the firm. So I ask people, so, so if you project yourself 
let's just say five years, it's a convenient horizon. If you project yourself five years into the future, what would you envision for the firm? In any way at all, you might want to describe the firm, uh, the size of the firm, the markets it would serve, just like we were talking about a moment ago, uh, geographic presence, uh, the type of organization it might have, uh, how it would deliver its projects, the technologies it might use, almost any dimension that would describe what the firm is going to be like in the future. Not a snapshot of what it is today, but what it can be, and more importantly, what you would want it to be out there five years. I say five years because, honestly, things change so rapidly. Looking out beyond five years is the crystal ball gets kind of murky. You know, It's a little bit difficult to see. Shorter than five years is not very visionary, in my opinion. Time goes by pretty quickly. Three years, that's not much of a vision. So most people think five years is a comfortable thinking horizon. So that's the first question I ask. And Ray, can and I you stop know, you there oh, and just, and just ask a follow-up question to that? When, yes, please. When you ask that question, um, are people generally able to verbalize and give some good a good vision? That's a good question, Enoch. Um, typically, firm leaders, more senior people, people with more experience, are better suited to do that than more junior people. Um, sometimes when I work with smaller firms, uh, they want me to talk with everybody in the firm. And and to be frank about it, um, people with not much experience under their belts have a little more difficulty thinking into the future that far, and they just don't know that much. They haven't been with other employers. They have don't have the basis. Yes. Okay. And... <laughs> What, just another follow-up question on that. What kind of things should pe pe or, or what kind of things could pe people be thinking about in terms of the future, in terms of that five-year horizon? You mentioned the size of the firm. The markets that they want to be in, that the firm would want to be in. Uh, geographically, where does it want to practice? In the case of larger firms, that ge geography question could even mean where would we have other offices potentially? Uh, what services? the firm wants to provide. I mean, more and more architecture is being very broadly defined as, as really project delivery, uh, starting way before schematics and ending way after CDs and CA. Mm. Um, technologies, that's hard to look into the future. That changes especially fast. Uh, so those are the kinds of, of uh, attributes. And the way I the way I like to think of a vision for the future of a firm is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, as low tech as that is, you know, when you dump a bunch of pieces out on a tabletop, you've got a, a bunch of little little pieces, each one of which is a, a fragment of an image uh, and doesn't necessarily make sense by itself. But when you put a bunch of those pieces together, you get a picture, a picture of uh, the Grand Canyon, a palm tree in Hawaii, whatever it might be. And that's the way I think of a vision for the future of a firm. It's not a single statement. It's not a mission statement. It says, it, it has pieces that fit together that collectively describe what the firm is going to be like. Bullet points, if you want, it doesn't really matter. The wordsmithing is not that important. The content is what's important. So, so when I work with firms to develop their vision, which is really the destination at the end of a roadmap, sort of that stake in the ground that you're aiming toward, um, I think that that should be descriptive and multidimensional so that somebody who reads it who might not have been in the planning retreat or workshop would read it and understand it the same way you understand a, a, a picture of the palm tree or the Grand Canyon and say, yeah, that's the kind of firm I'd like to work for. That's the kind of firm that I want to be a part of. That's part of the idea of the vision. And I interrupted you when you were talking about the questions. So that oh, was yes. the first question and please continue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, typically follow-up questions would be pros and cons, if you will. Um, certainly, I want to know about the strengths of the firm, the kind of things that could help it reach its vision, the kinds of things you want to preserve and build around and, and not change over time. And every firm has its own unique strengths, the things that separate it from other firms. Uh, and then, of course, conversely, you want to know what the shortcomings, the weaknesses, the problems are, challenges. There are many euphemisms for this. What are the issues in the firm that again, stand in the way of getting where we're going because too many firms trip over themselves. They they have problems. Ours is not an easy profession, as I said. So the issues, the problems can be vast and wide ranging. They can have to do with leadership, 
with ownership, with marketing, with financial management, uh, with accountability, human resources, um, almost almost anything. And in my experience, the almost anything almost always revolves around people. Rarely are the issues that would keep a firm from getting where it wants to go technology, hardware, or software. Those are too easily solved. Uh, architecture firms aren't in the business of manufacturing widgets. We are a people business. We employ people. And most issues in most firms tend to revolve around people. People either not doing what they're supposed to do or perhaps doing what they're not supposed to do. Um, and and that that's what makes this job interesting. <laughs> One of the many things, right? One of the many. Well. Ray, what are some some common, I guess since you have sort of this broad perspective, being able to work with a number of different architecture firms and even other industries like engineering. Um, yes. I'd like to ask you, what insights do you think do, and this is maybe going to be an anthema here, you know, kind of a, a question people might not, <laughs> what things could architects learn from engineering firms? If if you've ever looked at any industry surveys, uh, and there are uh, companies like like Zweig White, my former employer, like PSMJ, both excellent companies. And one of the things those firms are good at is publishing industry surveys. So they publish uh, an annual financial performance survey. Each of those companies does, where they show every single financial performance indicator you can imagine, including, of course, profitability. So they look at profitability of different types of firms. Universally, always, every time, engineering firms are more profitable than architecture firms. And it's easy for we architects to ask ourselves, well, why is that? And what could we do to be as profitable as engineering firms? But I think that in my experience, and and I think over the 20 years, the last time I counted, I've worked with well over 100 firms in strategic planning. Architects do things. So, so you know, I'm an architect. I've been one for many years. Uh, um, I'm married to an architect. My best friends are architects. You're an architect. Architects do things where we get in our own way. Um, uh, we we carry around a lot of uh, mental and emotional baggage related to design. We're taught that from the first year of architecture school, of course. And, and engineers don't necessarily look at the world that way. Um, they don't have that, if you will, baggage to drag around with them. Uh, they do their job. Uh, they do it well, just as architects do, but it's a little bit simpler, a little bit more linear. Um, I wouldn't want engineers to be insulted by this, but I think it's a plain fact that they run more profitable businesses because they are more business-like than architects. Architects are more concerned about image, certainly more concerned about design. And that story I told you earlier about the firm in the Pacific Northwest is probably a pretty good illustration of that. They were making money on the less design oriented work and they were losing money on the more design oriented work i have to say that that's not always the case there certainly are architecture firms that do excellent design that are well known for design and that are highly profitable too so the two are not mutually exclusive it's only that over an entire profession and over an entire industry architectural profits tend to be depressed and i believe one of the reasons has to do with a concern over design and image and the inefficiencies that come with that. Well, how do you think an architecture firm might be able to remedy that without compromising the value of design or the importance of design? That's probably a topic that's for a question. An, another, that's probably a topic for another one of these presentations, another one of these interviews, and perhaps with somebody else. Um, uh, I think that there are architecture firms that treat design uh, efficiently and don't necessarily belabor it or over belabor it, if that's even a word. I also think that it has something to do circling back to the focus on target markets and those areas where the firm has the greatest expertise. Typically, if an architect is asked to design something in a project type that they don't have experience in, it will take them longer to do it than one in which they've worked before. They'll be less efficient and arguably less effective in their design. So, so sometimes the greatest value that architects can bring to their clients is this body of knowledge uh, 
a, a phrase that's bandied about a, a lot today is thought leadership, mm-hmm. is is the the expertise that they have over and above other architecture firms and certainly over and above their clients. And that allows them to do that design work efficiently, effectively. And if they're up on the latest trends and what's going on in the client's industry, they can do it better and come up with a better product than than other firms can. So I think that keeping that eye on the ball, maintaining that focus, uh, lends itself to greater efficiency, probably better quality design, and uh, and subsequent increased profitability. Ray, if we take the example of a firm who wants to, let's say a, a sole practitioner or a, a smaller firm that wants to get more into the design-oriented side of things, for instance, what would you say to the architects who want to get away from clients that don't really understand the value of design, clients that are price shopping, or clients that view architecture as a commodity, and get more into the echelon of, hey, we want to work with people that understand design, we want to work with people that allow us to be creative in our designs? It's hard, Enoch. Um, You know, uh, uh, the past five, six, seven years have not been kind to uh, architecture firms. Mm -hmm. And clients have become accustomed, maybe even more accustomed than they were before, to being able to um, to buy architectural services cheaply. And there's just no other way to say that. And I think even now in 2014, we're still living with the hangover of that. And the result has been what I would call a commoditization of architecture and, by the way, engineering services. Um, and that means that many of those types of clients whom you just described have a difficult time distinguishing between firm A, firm B, and firm C other than on the basis of price. So that's the price shopping that you were just talking about. No architecture firm wants to work for that kind of a client. There are firms who do work for that kind of a client. Nobody really wants to. I think the answer to that is in what I was just describing. Decide what target markets you want to be in. And there are even markets that you would think would lend themselves to commoditization in which there are clients who appreciate the greater value, the thought leadership that an architect brings. Because in truth, in any project, the architectural fee is a relatively minor line item in a pro forma compared to the construction costs. So if architects can offer evidence, proof, if you will, that they know something that will save the client money, that will uh, result in an improved building, that can save construction costs, that can save life cycle operating costs, that will benefit the client more than their fee, and certainly more than the differential between their fee and firm ABC or firm XYZ, I think that's a powerful argument. Too few architects go down that road and are willing to invest in that. I have a suspicion that a lot of architects would say that they understand that. They know how to deliver that kind of value. They they can give those kind of savings but yet they might say that their clients don't understand that. So what do you have suggestions for how to go about positioning themselves to be in the position to where either they educate their clients or their clients come pre-educated with an understanding of what that architect brings to the table? This is hard. Um, So there's an emerging field called evidence-based design. And uh, it, it began in healthcare facilities, specifically Uh, hospitals. And now it is spreading to other project types, other building types. Uh, And when it began in healthcare, uh, architects were able to prove that certain types of design, certain patient room designs would lend themselves to shorter patient stays and faster recoveries, that certain designs of healthcare units with nursing and other patient rooms made for more efficient use of nursing and resulted in fewer nurse hours, uh, which is a cost savings to the hospital. Um, That's been done in correctional facilities too. Uh, Not the part about the shorter stays, by the way, just the part about fewer hours and fewer labor hours to really monitor it. And it's been done in educational facilities with respect to educational classroom design, schoolroom design, school design. So so clients are becoming slowly but increasingly more sensitized to the idea that architects who, to be direct, know what they're talking about 
and have this thought leadership can benefit the client in ways far in excess of the architect's fee. And again, far in excess of the differential, the delta between this architect's fee and that architect's fee. This is harder to do in, oh, let's say single family residential when you're working with custom homes or renovations for individual homeowners. That's the, the evidence-based design, the proofs that I mentioned before are more difficult. But in general, I think the more experience an architect can demonstrate that will hit home, be a bullseye with a client, the more likely the client is to be willing to pay the architect's fee. Very well. Ray, in, in our next segment, we talked about you going over sort of a checklist to help our listeners go through their own sort of strategic planning process. Is that something we can talk about in the next segment? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Well, Ray, it's, it's been an excellent um, conversation so far, and I, I look forward to speaking with you more about this strategic planning process and specifically some case studies and some examples of how we can apply this to our business. Very good, Enoch. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.